This is the um, OGM weekly call, Open Global Mind weekly call for Thursday, April 18th, 2024. I am looking for the AI summary that Zoom has elegantly hidden from me at this point. So I don't know if we'll have an AI summary for this call because <clears throat> I'll have to look for it separately. And we are back. I, I, I would love to go back and revisit um, the topic we were on last week, just last week which was uh, broadly about trauma, also about the Gaza situation and the mess, uh, the mess there and the humanitarian mess there. Um, it's whatever mix of those things that we're comfortable with. And um, I think I was interested in, in figuring out, uh, giving us a moment to, to sit and think, but starting with the question for each of you, if you'll take a moment, I'll, I'll give us a, a minute. Um, can we write into the chat, what is the most important question around trauma for you. Um, and it could be, uh, hey, we we are over-diagnosing trauma. We're way too overspent on this thing. It could be, hey, trauma is more pervasive than we think and we under-report it and don't deal with it properly and it's the, it's the way out. It could be, um, gosh, there's really other things that are more important. It could be, any any number of things that that have to do with the topic, but I'd love to figure out what are your core questions. What is the most important thing around this topic for each of you? So let's take a moment, and I will write the question into the chat, um, and we'll go quiet for a little bit until everybody's had a chance to put something in. Don't wait to put something in the chat. Just go ahead and hit return whenever you're done. So the question, the question I'm asking everyone to answer in the chat silently for a moment is what is the most important aspect of trauma to you? And it, it, this might be a very personal thing, like how do I get through personal trauma might be the most important thing about trauma to you. But um, <clears throat> what, um, and, and take a moment to phrase this any, any way you think will work for a conversation for communicating what you mean by it, please. Uh, ready, steady, go. Right, go ahead, Doug. You're muted. Trauma is a reaction to an event or a trend. It isn't the core event itself. That sounds fun. It, 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 trauma is a response. Absolutely. Uh, so um, uh, if you'll figure out what, how do that, how that fits into your worldview and add it to the, to the room. That'd be great. Um, Carl, thanks for joining. We are taking a moment quietly and answering in the chat. What is the most important aspect of trauma to you? I'll wait for another little bit, and uh, then I think I'll um, I'll ask Eric to jump in. But then I'm going to read all the replies out into the room, just so we can pause with each of them. Uh, but let me wait for a second while a few of you are still.
Hey, Stuart, we're all quiet mm -hmm. because we're now, um, I've asked everybody to answer a question in the chat. And the question is, what is the most important aspect of trauma to you? I will be reading those back into the room shortly. So you'll you'll catch up with the ones you've missed in the in the chat um, where you are. Thanks, Stuart. Um, Dave, we are quietly answering a question in the chat, and I'm about to go back and read them back in. What is the most important aspect of trauma to you? Um, and let me go to Eric, and then I will read the responses back. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I wasn't here last week, so let me just give you my overview of what I believe trauma is. <laughs> I think... Um, it's in the popular media, they tend to focus on the big major traumas like veterans coming home, but there are so many minor traumas that we go through um, in our lives. And I think it's mostly related to unexpected changes in our lifestyle, major changes, and, uh, major events, stress. And um, I did have therapy for trauma from a previous relationship. And um, I went through EMDR with paddles um, and uh, that helped, um, but it is a process of adjustment to a new lifestyle or way of life. And I guess my therapist told me that with COVID, everybody is going to have trauma. And because uh, being locked down, such a major change of lifestyle, and now trying to get back and reintegrate, I'm finding that it is a bit overwhelming to me, even though I do get out and I am doing new things like uh, teaching children music, which is wonderful. But then I need to retreat back to that isolation for my sanity, it seems that uh, so it's like a rubber band until I get more comfortable with fully participating in society. And I guess there's all kinds of fears that are still out there. So, but I think I have moved a lot of things into a virtual space. So for example, I'm connected with Sam Han with GCC and uh, I've uh, become interested in uh, Douglas Engelbart's work, talking with him about that. And uh, he's very excited that somebody else is interested in it. So, <laughs> yeah. So we got to look at the, the bright side and avoid a lot of the negative stuff that the world throws at us. But we have to recognize, yeah, like what happened in Israel is major trauma. And those people are going to deal with it. And the Arab side too, they're going to have generations of trauma. So, yeah, let's uh, just breathe in and take our time looking at this. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. That's a lovely, lovely way to start us down this road. And thanks also for sharing personally like that. Um, means a lot. And I'm happy we were a place you're comfortable um, being. Um, and it's lovely to have you here. Um, so so uh, Eric had written for me, I'm still dealing with trauma, the trauma that began with COVID isolation. I've changed my lifestyle and attitudes will still impact my life. I did have therapy for trauma after my previous relationship ended, which he just, he just talked about. Um, Stacy wrote, uh, what are the necessary steps that we have to take as a society understanding that most people carry some level of unresolved trauma? Do you want to add anything to that? I love the what? question. When it's my turn, I'll start from there because oh, I do okay. have a lot of stuff. Thanks. Um, okay, so so let me go um, read back through and then open up the queue because I was I was kind of going to pause it, everybody, and it makes sense to just uh, for me to go through all of them and and come back. <clears throat> so Kevin 
Um, Kevin had surgery for the first time this week. So my body's always done what I told it to with surgery for the first time in my life this week. For the first time, my body is not doing what my not mind knows it can do, but can't just now for reasons that are not clear to my limbic brain. Ow. <clears throat> and then you posted a couple, excuse me, you posted a couple times after, which I'll come, come back to as well. Uh, in fact, then you said hidden trauma that I wasn't aware of is the problem. It impacts and distorts actions and reactions. Uh, then I wrote, I'm concerned that trauma is more widespread than we admit it is, but at the same time, we're diluting its meaning. <clears throat> so my wish is that we harness our understanding of trauma better to use it as a key component for the way forward. Um, Kevin also wrote, uh, true for me, Klaus, I was not encouraged as a big boy to acknowledge trauma, which I think is a, a really big, important thing. It's a, a bunch of people who were taught. My mom, for example, Eric, when you said trauma is what happens to people in war, that was my mom. And my mom, I'm quite sure, had a whole bunch of unresolved trauma that haunted her as her mind started to go the last five years of her life. Um, so a whole bunch of nightmares and other strange behaviors crept in as her ability to control reality and perception weakened. Um, anyway, <clears throat> then um, Judy writes... Uh, trauma is a word that encourages denial. Might we ask ourselves and others what is most upsetting or challenging for you? How do we support one another in noting and addressing trauma and addressing trauma? Um, Kevin, again, trauma is a loss of control over my body I used to have today. Uh, Patty <clears throat> writes, is it possible to move treatment for trauma into collective healing spaces or group healing modalities as opposed to the more traditional isolated, siloed experiences we have in individual therapy, <clears throat> which, while important and necessary, also tends to be widely inaccessible to the majority of the population. Just try using the healthcare system to get mental health help. Just just try. It's uh, The whole thing is is written very, very poorly. Um, Patty, I had, a, I had a housemates when I lived in New York and worked for Esther. I had housemates, uh, <clears throat> the youngest of whom, whose mother owned our, our big flat, uh, was into RC, re-evaluation co-counseling, which um, seen from one lens is a really, really nice way of peer counseling. Seen from other perspectives sounds a little bit like a cult. And it sometimes get, gets dropped into the cult bin. But what I saw was really powerful, including um, I sat in on one session and one of the things they do is they give everybody like five minutes of, with the floor so that they can stand in front of everybody and be heard and nobody will judge them for anything. 80% of the people start crying because we are so unaccustomed to being heard without judgment. We are, we are so, it just does not happen in our lives. So given that moment, um, everybody just, the emotions just started coming out. It was really, really interesting. So I, I'm, I'm on board with your, your question a lot. Uh, John, uh, who is the, whose Zoom user is, is uh, John Kelly. Uh, trauma is fairly universal and can be caused by externally minor events or things like war, violence, racism, et cetera. Key personal issue is it's nearly impossible to see outside or get beyond the personal effects of trauma with professional assistance. That's really interesting and saddening. Um, I have a huge collection of people who seem to be very, very good at dealing with trauma in my brain from Gabor Mate and Bessel van der Kolk and a bunch of others. Uh, Steve Levine, I think, is another one. There's a bunch of people who's, who are really excellent at, at trauma, but I don't know that we've conquered it or figured out exactly how to deal with it. But I think that's an interesting thing for us to maybe share. Um, and then uh, Kevin, Kevin, again, uh, meaning that the bodily control and all that will come back. <clears throat> Pete's question is, how might we keep societal trauma, which accrues from individual trauma, family trauma, all the way up to civilizational trauma, from creating irrational, disproportionate, and unfair social institutions. Love that. Um, totally agree. Uh, Pete fits wonderfully with the stuff I'm working on like now. So, uh, Carl writes that it's a core part of empathy that is part of the human condition. Everyone is dealing with trauma. Absolutely. Um, Stuart writes, how past trauma impacts current realities personally, communally, and globally. Uh, Doug writes, people don't like change. Trauma is extreme change. So trauma is on a spectrum. Um, and then <clears throat> uh, 
Eric talks about, I tried RC many years ago and it was a nice experience, but I had to leave it after a while. I can sort of understand that. Um, so thank you for that. That was um, really helpful and interesting. Uh, happy to hear from anybody who would like to expand on what they wrote or take us in any of those directions. Stacy, please. Yes. So I apologize in advance for maybe generalizing a little bit or not use, not being as tactful as I can be, but I'm gonna to try to make a few points in as quick as time as possible. Sounds great. And neither neither Ken nor Gil are on the call, so nobody will question you about the word we if you happen to use the word we. <laughs> I might. <laughs> okay, so, good. La last week when um, I knew we were gonna be talking about trauma, I wasn't feeling that well either, also going for surgery. So I know how Kevin feels and it is a strange kind of physical trauma, but anyway. Um, I wasn't going to come to the call. I wasn't feeling great. And to be honest, I have spent a lot of time talking about trauma, like for 30 years, and I've been witness to people's personal trauma. And when I go to a group, I want to hear from their expertise. And I don't really think of OGM as like, with the exception of a few people, I didn't want to hear about people talking about other people's traumas. That's not really that interesting to me. But when Gil sent the letter about um, Israel, I was like, you know what? I really want to be there for that. That being said, one of the conversations that come up that I hope at some point we do talk about is how some people take trauma and turn it into something really wonderful, while other people turn it into something that traumatizes more people. And that's something I hope we will discuss on another call. What I do want to say, though, is that without a doubt, the most meaningful thing that happened on the call was Ken's reading of his poem. And I say that, and I wish he was here, but I'm sure he'll see the recording. So here's where the generalizations come in. Women have been doing this for a while. We found our courage. We found our voices. We knew we'd be making ourselves more vulnerable by sharing, and we did it anyway. And sometimes it hurt us even worse, but still we did it. Right now, men need to be the ones sharing, becoming vulnerable, and doing it. And it's a little bit easier now than it was, let's say, 10 years ago. I mean, I remember John Boehner crying you know, I look now and I hear Trump and his biggest thing to mock people is how this one came to him crying. It's still very difficult for men to do it, but men need to do the heavy lifting now. And that means they need to come together collectively, sort of, I think what Patty is alluding to, because I don't see this as a separate mental health issue. That's wrong. Separating it into like, making it something that unhealthy people have to go and do is not the way to do this. This has to be a normalization of something that happens to all of us. And I think that by men doing it together, it becomes an easier lift. Um, whether we like it or not, men are mostly in power and behind a lot of the decisions happening, causing the wars, causing all of these things. I've been listening to some younger men in whether they be in the MAGA movements or whatever. What I hear is horrifying. And again, I think about people that join gangs. I mean, all again, I'll, I'll probably start to ramble, so I'm gonna stop. And I'm gonna leave it by saying, as a society, we need to find a way to heal, I don't wanna make it just about men, but I'm gonna say it's gonna to have to come from men now. Women will be there to support you. We've shown you how to do it, but you guys gotta do it. And um, I think that the, the other thing I wanna say is that we've been talking about empathy, empathy and I've been seeing some memes go around how by reading fiction, you gain empathy. Um, I, I think I gained a lot of my empathy as a kid watching TV, you know, like TV shows and seeing experiences that way. And, you know, I watch a lot of TED Talks 
that I think help to increase empathy. But the problem is the people that need to see those things or read those things aren't the ones watching or reading. So how do we incorporate into a system, and it's gonna have to be the educational system or a way that brings people to the stage for some other reason to watch? How do we get people that wouldn't normally hear these stories or watch these stories to be in the audience or to be participating? Because we need to figure out how to do that. And th that's my two or three cents. Thank you. Stacey, and thank, thank you, you. Ken, for doing that. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Uh, Ken wrote me a note that said he has a, a client appointment, so he won't be able to make today's call. So he won't. I don't think he'll make it at all. Um, and I, I, I loved Ken's poem last week, and I misunderstood. I thought he was actually reading someone else's poem, and he straightened that out afterward, and I was very glad he did. <clears throat> um, so thank you for remembering that, Stacey. Um, and Patty, take your time whenever you'd like to step in. <clears throat> Thank you, Stacey. Um, a couple of things that came up for me as Stacey was sharing that feel um, that they they felt really present to me recently as I con continue to to think about um, the topic of trauma and how to address it at, um, at from a wider, more collective space rather than these individual spaces. I think what feels important to name, at least for me personally, is the role that social cost has in let's say uh, specifically the context of Stacey sharing like you know can what would it look like for for men to be more vulnerable to emote more to express more to share more to start doing some of that lifting I think that's the language that Stacey used and you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong there I think it would be un, um, unrealistic to expect that until we see wider societal modeling of what that could look like and I think that I, I get the sense just in my lived experience that the men that I interact with, um, there is um, a want for that and a desire for that and a need for that. I see men in my own community coming together in spaces to create that, which has been a, an amazing and beautiful thing to to witness. And, you know, I, as I as I survey that specific cohort, I'm able to see that each of those men had, or I've heard, I've heard them tell me. They've had mentors who have modeled what it looks like to be able to share with vulnerability and to be able to um, express in ways that historically aren't, let's say, propped up by uh, mainstream social media or the movies we watch, the TV shows that we watch and aren't um, encouraged, right? And or even, you know, as, as Stacey shared in, in many instances, they can be um, vilified and um, condemned and shamed. And so I think it, it would be just... An important piece of this conversation as a whole to me feels like just acknowledging the the cost of what we stand we, we perceive ourselves to we might lose if we do move forward into even just trauma healing in general or into this kind of deeper emotional work there is a real cost um to that or at least there could be a perceived cost to that that i think does act as a limitation um sometimes for those who might be on the edge of exploring that space but don't really know how to engage more deeply um so I think that that came up for me, but I especially I just want to acknowledge that the, um, this is just my opinion, but the social cost for men publicly and let's just say publicly exploring what that looks like with other men too uh, has, has seemed to me like it's a really big risk. Um, and it can be a big risk in, in a, let's say a room of men, if, if one man risks that kind of vulnerability um, that that is that is um, that can be a real risk for safety and also how that man is perceived among others. So I just want to name that that's a really complex dynamic that I feel needs to be addressed at um, a higher level before we can expect this kind of societal change. Which I agree with you, Stacey. I think is 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 of utmost importance, and the timing is uh, feels urgent. Um, I think something that also came up for me. I think this was this might have been Jerry's share, and Jerry, maybe this wasn't what you were alluding to, but I'm really present to, I feel like the, the semantics of this conversation can be a big limitation. How, and I think it was um, Judy who expressed maybe even just using the word trauma can be a real barrier to people exploring and engaging with this conversation 
because it just it can so and understandably so immediately activate this like defense denial, which is a protective mechanism, right? So how can we can we is this is this a matter of changing the language used so so that we can have this conversation more effectively? I thought about this a lot myself. I thought about the possibility of calling you know just like swapping out the word trauma with something like and like nervous system disruptor or nervous system distressor, just something that's a little more clinical and and less just holds less charge and stigma just to be able to have these conversations with people because I've had conversations with people who um, maybe partake in the um, the MAGA side of this conversation and, and just shut off the moment that trauma is the word trauma is introduced into the room. I have to go at 940, so about 10 minutes. So thanks for letting me speak and get, get some time in. I think I feel complete with that. Thanks, Patty. Um, my friend Charles Warren, whom some of you in the room know, uh, pre-pandemic started a mental health startup. Um, I'll remember what it is in a sec. I'll look it up in my brain. But he knew that he couldn't call it mental health or or depression uh, counseling or anything like that. So he framed it as mental fitness, which was genius. And it was a combination of six in-person sessions and an app. Um, and basically, uh, his co-founder, there was a falling out that, that meant the thing didn't, didn't keep going on. But I thought it was just like, like really beautifully and elegantly framed to sidestep and then step into, sidestep but not avoid, um, some words that might cause people who could really use the help to not show up and start using uh, the, the tools and processes. So I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, and then... I'll, I'll put a couple, uh, I, I've done a little bit of it in the chat, but I want to make more explicit maybe something of what um, you and Stacy were just talking about, which is like toxic masculinity, the manosphere, uh, what's happening to men these days, and whether it's stoicism or other kinds of things, th there's a whole series of Joe Rogany kind of uh, mo movements that are, and in fact, all of MAGA tries to be sort of uh, explicitly uh, stereotypically nasty male dominant male uh, in practice and in, uh, in 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 approach and i i i find it a horrible um i grew up it's very weird i grew up ashamed of men um my dad was not a reason for this my dad was a great dad like taught me a bunch of stuff um he and my mom never sorted things out particularly well but but my dad wasn't the cause for this. It was frat boys. It was it was everybody who was an asshole and who was an asshole from testosterone or something. I don't know what it was, <clears throat> but but I I grew up not liking that part of my gender, um, and so th that's kind of weird. Um, but there's this whole uh, I've lost my train of thought a little bit. Oh, the manosphere. Um, and there's a there's a an appropriation of an expansion of and a superheating of these elements by I think the far right because it's really working politically, and and a piece of what's important to me also that I didn't put into my statement earlier is the weaponization of trauma as an instrument of aggression in the political sphere and the socio emotional sphere, and it's been done very very effectively uh, to the point where. A decade ago, the far right's complaint against the left was that every, everybody on the left were snowflakes, right, for being so emotional. And and so, and I remembered one more thing I wanted to add, which is that it feels like this to me is maps into one of my models for how progress actually happens, which is that on social issues, for example, we hit a big change. Something happens. Somebody passes a law that gay marriage is okay, or somebody uh, allows women to vote. Oh my God, women, they, why should they vote? There's no way they could like, like make good decisions. No, no, no. We're going to give them the vote. And then there's backlash over and over and over again. But it's like a ratchet mechanism and the backlash happens. But then if, if society is doing okay, the general trend is, uh, you know, the long arc of history bends towards justice, I think is actually sort of true. It's just that the backlash is miserable and sometimes really devastating. And I think we're going through a, a period of that right now where the things we're talking about are actually being used as techniques in the in the in the arena of debate and conflict and society. Uh, and they're being used, I will add, extremely effectively. And one of the things I would love to know is how do you diffuse that from happening? How do you pop that bubble? How do you pour water on that fire? 
how do you, you know, and maybe the route is compassion, maybe it's something else. I'm not entirely clear. And certainly Biden doesn't seem to have figured that one out. Um, Stuart, then Carl, please. Yeah, so Jerry, I think when you opened, <clears throat> you pointed directly at the problem. The idea that the friend of yours had to use euphemisms <laughs> to talk about what is such an intricate part of being human. <laughs> Slash, we're all born with these bio uh, biological machines and they don't come with a manual. And part of living is learning how to operate your particular machine. And it's filled with biochemical reactions that are not, quote, <laughs> rational all the time. And you have to learn how to operate it just as much as you have to operate it physically and go to doctors uh, to take care of mechanical and physical injuries, the mental functioning, which is such an amazing and key part, um, we need to learn how to operate it, how it works. I think there's a huge amount of incredible fear on the part of men, fear of women, fear of matriarchy, that's why women have been held down for such a long time, um, because guys are absolutely afraid of the power of women. Um, and they are. Um, uh, and until we learn how to develop real partnerships, um, society will not quite um, be correct. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit of deja vu listening to the conversation slash we've been over this so many 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 times before and it's a question of of will and intention of educating men as part of their coming of age um i don't know i went to the robert bly michael michael mead uh men's mendocino workshops in the late 80s you know 1990 it's 35 years ago. Um, the, the notion of the need to do this has been around for such a long time. And yet for some reason, um, I don't know, maybe it's maybe it's mass media, the 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 notion of of um social stereotypes perpetuates itself as opposed to the idea of um metrosexual males. Uh, becoming a much more um, dominant factor. Um, but emotional and social social learning um, is is something that's taking place in um, in high schools at this point in time. I think younger generations um, are much more attuned to what it is that we're talking about. So maybe there is some um, um, something to look forward to in the future as as, uh, male role models um, start to shift. We've made a fucking mess. <laughs> As leaders, we have just we have just created a fucking mess. We started all these wars. I think it's built in the biology <clears throat> in terms of projectiles and 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 crap like that. Um, that's all I want to say. <clears throat> Thanks, Stuart. Um, Carl, the floor is yours. Well, so many, so many things. I guess um, well, part of what Stuart was just saying and stuff. I think part of it is men are fe men fear that if women get power, that they'll act like men. So maybe that's um, and in general, like if you look at the history, it's like whoever's been the oppressed turn around and are seem to be even worse. I mean, the Puritans, uh, I mean, you can go back, you know, centuries, millennia on that part of it. Um, checked a little bit, like with Jerry, definitely college, the entire Pi Lamb fraternity at Wayne and Mary was high school wrestlers from Long Island. Talk about the, about the biggest group of jerks you can <laughs> find. Um, yeah, I'll post a link. I've done it 
does probably dozens of times already this year in multiple things, but there's a was a great interview that talks about how um, trauma and resilience cross generations. And one of the things is about rituals. And I think it's part part of it's getting people into into groups like this where they can you have they we have this process we've developed. I think the Quaker kind of silence and actually pausing has been one of the most powerful um, parts of the evolution since I've joined the group um, and things. And then um, I posted a link already, but um, I guess, well, um, you, Pete, and Judith attended my 99th birthday Engelbart's 99th birthday celebration. I've got a lot of things going on and I posted a link of um, to like all the videos I've collected. There was a huge um, event in 20, 2008 for the 40th anniversary of his demo. Um, SRI International in Stanford actually reconciled enough to honor <laughs> that but it was i mean there's been a lot of, and that kind of ties into this too i mean there's a lot of animosity between groups over power and um because it was stanford research institute is where doug worked um and things so i could ramble on responding to various things but i'll, I'll stop there thank you carol Tony. Yeah, thanks. I'll be quick and then I just gotta pop right off. Just to quick point to the to the conversation around um dynamics between men and women and men holding women down because men are afraid of women's power. I think that um I, I'm I don't say this to to be contrarian. Um oops, I'm getting a notification from Zoom to lower my hand. Uh don't worry about it. Not to be not to be contrarian, but um, just to to express that, like as as a female, it feels really clear to me, or a female body citizen, it feels really clear to me that what we're in that conversation, we're not talking about one side being wrong, one side being right. We're talking, I think, to me, what feels like the more upstream place to um, address and explore that topic is how both cohorts have been taught to manage their personal power, and I think that when um, when we both cohorts get really clear on what it looks like to manage power from the personal power, like power with and power rather than power over, because women have been have been trained and indoctrinated into a power over expression of power as well. We just it just tends to tends to generalization express a little differently. And you know, so we hear and we see, especially in media, this is super prevalent, um, the uh, archetype or the the trope of the really uh, manipulative female, right? Or the female who um, uses her her womb, her fertility to um, empower or power over men, right? And, you know what I mean? So like we, we, we've, I don't know, I just, I feel I have a lot of thoughts about this, but I think the conversation is so much more complex than men doing women wrong. And while that's that's very present in a very real part of the conversation, there's, there's just so much more depth to this. And I, I just, I really personally feel like it's time to steer away from the, you know, men powering over and men are the problem. I think that is the perpetuation of a very old conversation that actually does not support the collective empowerment of all. And I will end with that. Thank you all. I got to hop, but I will um, talk to you all soon. I might, I might be able to join the call if my call is short. So you can see. Patty, sorry, you have to bounce. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm, thanks. Um, Doug C. Maybe what men are afraid of about women becoming powerful is the loss of the feminine in our lives, uh, the softness, the beauty. Uh, think of the shift from skirts to pants. Uh, maybe we're losing something really critical. End of thought. I don't find women having power means they are not beautiful or can be soft. I'm not sure soft is a virtue here, so I'm confused a little bit. I think powerful women are really beautiful. Uh, so, Doug, I, I'm 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 hearing I'm hearing sort of a gender charge in what you said that um, isn't resonating for me. You want to say more? No. Okay. Um, Stacy. 
I need to take a breath <laughs> because. <laughs> take, a, take a deep breath. Go for it. I, I can't tell you how many times early on in my life I've been insulted. And the, the charge that was thrown at me was, you want to be a man. So to hear that is like, it kind of blows my mind a little bit, but, um, but going to, but, but let's say that that's a real fear because it kind of ties into where I wanted to pick up on what you were talking about, Jerry, which going back to this MAGA movement and how they've been able to utilize, I mean, here's the thing. I think many people that are drawn there do have unresolved trauma. And I think there is a large amount of fear there that they are covering up. And in some way, they're looking towards this powerful figure that's going to protect them. In, I mean, this is anecdotal, but in the people that I speak to, they have lots of walls built up around them. Many of them I know, I know they have good hearts. I knew them when they weren't like this. I've seen the change. And these are people that if they got too close to their own pain, they would just break. So instead, they build up these shells and these walls, and they just want to be angry. And somehow, when you're feeling angry, you feel more powerful. So when you ask, how do we counteract that? The problem is, when a normal person, a regular person, encounters somebody, some kind of energy that's coming at them, of course, we're going to become defensive. And so the energy we push out to them is also like attacking, which then confirms whatever fear they have. So it's it's like we would have to be so strong in ourselves that instead of doing exactly what they're afraid of, which is to attack, we'd have to actually be able to take a step back which is really hard to do unless you're really stable in yourself because it's like dealing with a child having a tantrum. So that that's the only thing I wanted to say. I'm not suggesting that's what we should do. I mean, sometimes, at least for me, the answer is don't even engage. If I don't have a lot of bandwidth, I won't even have the conversation with the person because I can only go for so long before I'm gonna wanna punch them in the face. And that's not a good thing. <laughs> Thanks. So, so Stacy, when um, when is your book coming out? <laughs> I don't or, know. Can, can Zoom write it for me? Can the transcripts write it for me? I've been waiting for AI to help me out, but and we're getting close to that. Or your course, your course, or something like that. I mean, really, yes, I'm 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 agreeing a lot with uh, where you're coming from on that. And it's funny. Sometimes the best. The best way to counter something is not to object to it and push back. It's to actually accept it, uh, and then see what happens, and then and then go with it. And if and if accepting it doesn't mean you personal harm, it just means listening to something that whatever that you might not want to hear. That's okay. But sometimes the other side just needs to be heard. They need to get get the words out and feel like the other person heard the words. This is one thing I really like about uh, nonviolent communication the worst named, most interesting kind of peacemaking process I know of, which is it asks each participant to, to paraphrase back to the other what they heard the other say. And the act of doing so has this really salutary effect. On the one hand, it tells the other person, I heard you well enough that I can at least paraphrase it and tell you back what you said in a way that you're like, yeah, that's roughly what I said. And then the act of my saying what the person I don't like or have an, a, a debate with, the act of my thinking through their position and saying it back to them softens me to their position somewhat as well. And, and lather, rinse, repeat, that, that has, I think it has a, a good effect overall. But we need more of these things. I love that in some schools they teach nonviolent communication in like kindergarten or first grade. And I read an article long ago about like, uh, two first graders who had a fight on the playground, pulled over a third one, and then they sat in the corner doing NVC. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's pretty cool. We need we need a lot of that. Very right. cool. Um, Carl, please. Uh, it's, um, well, I think um, some of the, I mean, I think some of our comments, have, I'm not going to speak necessarily for anybody else, but I mean, listening to comments, I think we were trying to explain kind of what or some ideas of why things are the way they are, but 
um, as Doug Breitbart using me, it's about being in the present and and then going forward and what how can we do things um, better and then back to the topic. I mean, I'm um, I'm a, a victim of World War II. My mom was born in Chicago. They um, my grandparents had a fight, and my grandmother decided to go visit her mom for her mom's 70th birthday in uh, 1939. So they got stuck over in the war. Um, when they found out at the end of the war, when they found out my mom was bilingual, they they brought a naive 15-year-old Catholic girl in to have to translate her stuff. So my mom was devastated from that and the impact of that so wow. uh, when I just see when I see what's I mean the all these all the kids in Ukraine in and now in Gaza and it just goes back and forth and who's retaliating against who I mean if you, you could go back centuries and stuff I mean it just I don't know how I don't know how we get break this horrible cycle but um yeah, that's. I look at the situation with Putin and Ukraine, and I I don't think Putin is in the middle of a group of people trying to do this. I think Putin, and I don't think he's doing it single handedly, but he has managed to somehow entrain all of the upper society and power structure of Russia to go suck up the flower of their youth and send them in the battle to die brutally, horribly. Uh, which is going to cause fresh new trauma, which will trickle through multiple <laughs> generations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, fresh new trauma at, at a scale that is very hard to imagine or understand. Um, uh, so, so I look at that and I'm like, how do, how do we stop this thing from happening? It's just really important that, that this not happen. And uh, unfortunately the best answer right this minute is to send more weapons into the zone. That's just horrifying. Um, Kevin, please. You're going to need to unmute, however, or we won't hear you properly. Uh, yes. So I, I just wanted to say that, you know, I come from a family of real strong women. And I'll tell a brief story about my grandmother to say the nature of my fear of women. Um, my grandmother was a uh, bookkeeper at a uh, furniture store in South Hayward. And she realized there was a pattern of uh, the store giving really good pensions, but fire, finding people to fire when they were 64 and nobody got it. And so she backdated her birthday about six or seven years ahead of it. And then went in and said, hey, I'm 65. He says, no, you're 64. He says, no, I'm 65. He says, oh, well, what you did is a crime. He said, no, I've documented you know, six cases of your fraud and you'll pay me my pension. Or I will I will deliver you over to the DA, and so mind got, blowing. Yeah, yeah, and and she she had plotted it and hadn't said a word till till that day. Mind so blowing. I, I, I I've, I've been bolstered by strong and brilliant women uh, helping men with you know issues of uh, anger management and 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 uh, irresponsibility. So I have no problem of women being in control. What I really hate seeing is when a woman is in control and the guy that she's in control of knows that she's treating him with contempt. And I think that's what I would fear if women, uh, you know, uh, right now the women around me don't, they're in charge, but they don't treat me with contempt. They respect what I do. You know, losing respect along with them being in control would be what I would fear, that something would happen and they wouldn't see the exchange like that anymore. Uh, I've had that with some younger black women who have just decided that there is no good ally. And some of the older black women are not working with them and can't afford to work with them because of how they sort of get well-meaning white guys to come in and just chop them up. And so, you know, it's, it's, it, it can happen in some markets, in some places with some people. So that's what I would fear. Thanks. That may be really specific. Thanks, Kevin. That's a mind-blowing story. I just posted a, a, a research paper uh, that says, basically, hey, hey, guys, matriarchies are not the opposite of patriarchy. Because I think one reason men fear women coming to power is like, holy shit, if women have power and they did to us what we've done to them, we are all fucked. 
and matriarchy is about more egalitarianism. Kevin, you're muted. I don't know if you're trying to talk to us. Um, uh, good. I guess you're not. And um, and so we don't we don't understand what egalitarian uh, kind of leadership often even looks like. We don't we don't have a taste for it. So we think our only options are communism or or capitalism and democracy, and that like that, that brew is very very potent and toxic. Uh, Stuart. Yeah. So on the uh, masculine feminine thing, I just wanted to say. Um, it's an interesting phenomenon that I've, I've had the privilege of being with uh, powerful women, uh, powerful, accomplished women um, all my life. Uh, my first wife was from matriarchy. And in the 60s, during the women's movement, she was kind of nonplussed by it. It was like, what? I mean, this is, you know, wow, we don't need any of this. We, we, <laughs> we have been equal or in charge for multiple generations. And so the idea of, of women's liberation was, it was just nothing. <laughs> Two, I, I wanted to speak Ken in Ken's voice, and I think we've got a lot of we going on, a lot of we. Um, that That is not um, all kinds of generalizations. And the third thing, perhaps to bring the conversation away from the um, the gender dialogue is that one of the um, concerns I and others have about trauma um, is its relationship to what I'll call identity politics slash people take their trauma and that becomes their primary identity. And so they live in deficit. And I think that that is um, really, really um, a harmful thing. You know, I, I, I don't say this glibly, and I say it glibly, it's kind of a little bit of get over it <laughs> is what we need. And it's, it's perhaps a, um, a phenomenon of how fortunate we all are that folks can dwell on their past peace. Um, if we have time, I'll read a a poem on resilience uh, a little bit later in the conversation. Thanks, Stuart. I th think the thing you just brought into the conversation could be at the topic of a whole call, although I don't know that we have the patience for it, given that we've been dwelling on trauma for a while. I wish we did, because I think it's really important. And I think it's a, it's a very big piece of the current political melee, is this idea of, of identity politics. And I, I meant to say earlier um, that me too and black lives matter and a bunch of movements like that were actually the voicings of trauma in attempts to redress the trauma which in large measure failed to have any traction uh also uh, the the guns movement the anti-guns movement all all of those all of those you know marjorie stoneham douglas and the the kids the kids out of there all of those are responses to trauma and and I don't mean social trauma, somebody called me a bad name trauma. I mean horrible trauma, uh, rape, murder, uh, you know, being shot while and being killed while in custody, a whole bunch of really, really, really bad, you know, grade A trauma. <clears throat> and my more conservative friend is like, progressives are just uh, positioning, they're sort of posturing um, to be in favor of all these things, but they just kind of move from the flavor of the month to the next flavor of the month, and then they don't really mean it. And my own take on it is, actually, no, I think these things are sincere. It's just that progressives don't lack, progressives lack the tools to actually make any progress on these issues. And the other side has done a supreme job of suppressing any sort of, pro you know, the idea that after this many mass murders, we don't have any gun laws really to speak of in the country, uh, shocks and stuns me. And and I, I don't understand it. Um, and the mere presence of guns causes guns gun accidents. Funny that, right? The, the mere presence of guns actually leads to more suicides, a bunch of other sorts of things. Sorry. Um, in some sense, trauma is just so pervasive in American society and cruelty is so taken for granted here that would be unacceptable in other countries that it breaks my heart. 
Um, Judy. I think that, am I unmuted? I never remember yes, to look. Yes, you are, you are. <laughs> um, this is a complicated topic and I don't know if I can articulate it appropriately, but trauma itself is a very loaded word which has distinct and rather different meanings to different people based on their own personal and family structure and all types of other experiences. And at the heart of it, it's to, to address trauma, I think we need to somehow significantly increase self-awareness and other awareness and an openness to not be judgmental because as soon as you start judging, it polarizes people entrench. <laughs> and they also um, will deny having a sensitivity issue almost universally. So somehow our culture needs to, in my opinion, become first self-aware and self-responsible because you certainly shouldn't be criticizing other people how they're managing themselves if you aren't managing yourself with a high level of awareness and noticing what hooks you, what causes you to stiffen up. I mean, there's all kinds of body cues, but unless you pay attention to them, you'll just let them hook you and drive you where you don't wanna go. And so I think it's, it's impossible to impose awareness on other people or to support their trauma unless they're willing to share it and kind of comb through it a bit. And sometimes a gentle observation does a lot more than anything else. Just you look tired today or you look, <laughs> you look like something's bugging you a little bit, um, but I don't wanna intrude. <laughs> and more than 50% of the time they'll say, wow, you're absolutely right. <laughs> and then they'll say something about what's going on. But if we don't talk about it and don't first acknowledge it in ourselves to be self-aware, it won't do any good to talk about it with other people because we'll be coming from a guarded, self-serving position. And this gets kind of psychological, but I think there's a lot of things that are traumatic that are everyday occurrences that we just ignore because they aren't what we see as the big traumas. And, and somehow, I don't know if I'm making any sense, but I just think self-examination and kind other awareness are key dimensions of trying to address trauma. And if you've done that, then you can think about larger scale trauma and whether there's some potential to organize to address it in a more systematic way. Um, Judy, you're making a lot of sense. I appreciate your sensitivity to the word trauma. And I think a piece of our conversation was about how approaching somebody and saying, what about your trauma is triggering to them and we'll probably turn them off. If not trauma, what do we call this? And how do we, how do we bring this dynamic into the conversation without alienating people and also without skirting the issue entirely? My word is uneasy. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'm picking up on something that isn't real, but you look a little uneasy today. <laughs> and they're, they're free to deny it, which is of course they're right anyway, but they might just share it. And they'll typically tiptoe in. They'll just say, wow, you're, you're kind of observant. <laughs> and yeah, I had a fight with my daughter this morning or whatever it was that triggered them that particular day. And again, it's it's more um, constructive, passive listening that in my, my experience offers the most help. And it sounds like in your professional career, you had several moments like this. Oh, well, sure. Yeah. Um, but it helped being married to a psychiatrist. <laughs> good, good. Who was the most least intrusive person I've ever met. Amazing. It was, uh, yeah, he, he was, he had the art and sensitivity to observe deeply and hardly ever asked a question unless it was a 
maybe you, it wasn't even a maybe you want to think about it. I'll give you an example. The, the best one he ever did with me was when I was in grad school and finishing my dissertation and stressing out about whether I was ever going to really get done. And I must have sounded depressed and enough on the phone that he said something and he said, well, you know, what would be so terrible if you didn't finish? <laughs> And I thought about it and I thought, well, my parents would be really disappointed. And he said, so you think they'd rather have you kill yourself than be not finish? <laughs> and I went, well, no, of course not. <laughs> but it completely shifted my point of view without in any way criticizing or judging or other things like that. And I was blessed to have this man in my life. <laughs> and the good news that. is since I had him in my life for 30 plus years, a lot of it's internalized now. So every day it's like, oh, Dick would ask me this question or Dick would say this. And the angriest I ever saw him get was standing across the room from me and I was doing something he called perseverating, which I didn't even know was a word at the time. And he'd go, that's enough. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> and that was so out of character for him that it got my attention. So, But I, I would wish that everyone has someone like that in their life or the opportunity to be that someone to other people. And in my mind, that's the biggest thing we could do to address trauma is to be kind to other people. Let's rest with that for a moment. Thank you. That's a lovely place to pause. Hey, Mike, you've stepped into a whirlwind conversation about trauma. We went back to last week's topic. Um, I started out with a question for everyone to type into the chat about what is the most important question about trauma for you? Like what, what should we be sort of exploring and asking? We've gone really interesting places. Um, so glad I joined just in time to hear those last comments. Yeah. Because I was actually just thinking about that, how, how lucky I am to have that, that special person. And... Uh, how all of us should happen. Really agree. Stuart. Yeah. And picking up on, on what Judy just shared about being kinder is also not being so dumb. How can we how can we all learn to be a little bit smarter? I mean, right now, as I observe, you know, people are just doing stupid shit all the time. It's just, it's absolutely amazing how <laughs> you know the, the 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 stupid stuff people do i don't know it's you know it's not like what were you thinking it's what are you thinking and, and are they, you thinking that was what i was going to say next mike it, and it's just that people aren't thinking there's a constant level of reaction and you know what i what i said earlier about operating their own being, their own machine. I mean, that's some of the stuff that needs to happen in, in our educational process, that people really need to learn how to uh, um, be socialized, you know, to live among people, or as, a, as a, a, a wonderful consulting partner of mine used to say, some people are just not housebroken. Um, 
and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I, I want to I want to play with the word education because we brought it up a couple times here. We need to educate men to do blank. We you know we need to educate kids to understand social emotional learning, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I I agree, but I disagree in the following way. I'm not sure this is a, about education in the sense of what you learn in the classroom and how you teach it from a text kind of thing. I think this is a matter of socialization and learning. And for, to me, learning, teaching, and schooling and education are very different things. Um, and the word I like in that crowd is learning. I think learning happens through interaction. And I think a piece of what we've blown, a piece of what we've messed up, is that we've lost a lot of the interactions that we had and the interdependencies that we had that let us understand that we were valuable, that let us understand that even however tiny we were, we had a role in society, that people cared for us. Um, we've done, like all those things, we've, we've many of them, we've broken. Um, and we've broken them kind of in modernist societies and in more in big cities than out in rural places. And one of the things that I think rural folk marvel at is how broken society seems to them in the other places that aren't like them because they take care of the elderly they you know they, they do they do a bunch of things that a society kind of does that's one one role that churches have uh or any kind of uh religious organization is they bring people together to take care take care of the crowd of the group uh, it's very interesting that way um, and then mentioning churches brings me to a point I wanted to bring up way earlier in this conversation, but didn't make sense to put in. And it doesn't make that much sense right now, but I just want to say it before we're out of time on this call, which is that it really strikes me that a major piece of Judaism and Christianity is the telling and retelling of trauma stories. Major major piece of the the crucifixion the you know the, the the all the stories that are told as part of the core of the canon of at least both of those and i'm not familiar enough with islam to know i know that islam means surrender and there's a whole different sort of ways of looking at it but those are the three abrahamic religions but certainly of the of two of the ones that i'm more familiar with the retelling of trauma is and and why happy passover like, like yeah. and, and, and happy easter i'm sorry we're celebrating the crucifixion oh we're celebrating i guess the resurrection okay i'm still a little confused so what effect does that have on people in these religions that trauma is so central to the story that they're all agreed to and does that have an influence in the dynamics that we're talking about I mean, I can only speak for my. I can only speak for myself. Um, yeah. th there was a short period of time where I did go to temple, and I know for me, hearing those stories always tapped into, "We will survive together." So, but I guess that depends on who the leader is and what they're drawing upon. Yeah. You know, Pete said something last week when he was talking about where the where the DNA of, you know, the, the part that survived. And when when you were saying that, Pete, all I kept thinking is that means that we all carry that recessive gene for that for that kind, sensitive, wonderful part. And if we just harnessed it and united it, how powerful we would be. Totally agree. And and I think it's just uh, it seems like it's a source of frustration for some of us too. We can't play along with the conquistador kind of mindset. It's like, what are we even doing? Why would we do that? There's a a, a bunch of um, thinking about intergenerational trauma. Talks about how trauma affects gene expression. That's a, a big core part of the theory of intergenerational trauma. Is that um, different genes can be activated by external events, thereby causing uh, different consequences for the same genetic material. Right? Like, like it can actually affect the structure uh, of the self. I find that really, really interesting because we tend to think of genetic change as very slow change. Uh, but the gene expression theory seems to say, well, yeah, kind of. Um, 
a lot of stuff can happen more quickly than we think it does and and in a more prof and in a more profound way than we think it does and i tread into these waters very lightly because i am no life scientist at all eric yeah hi so um growing up in judaism I recognize that a lot of it is about the socialization of how kids are taught and uh, how parents um, bring them to things. So like a lot of my growing up, expending Sundays with my father at a uh, pool club and hearing uh, the men in the sauna room making jokes and all kinds of attitudes. And I felt something was wrong at that time, that the way they talked about women or um, attitudes about it, like their ethnic jokes. And in a way that that was a way for them to connect, to bond as men. And uh, because they grew up in that. So, I mean, the stories are there for a reason to teach history, to get the kids questioning what happened, why do we do this? So Passover is a time for kids to ask all the questions. Why are we drinking wine? Why are we eating matzah and all that? Um, but uh, there's more, uh, I mean, I've been to play to like Orthodox rabbis and the kids are absolutely um, in awe of the father figure and uh, the father runs the, the mother does all the work, but the father runs the dinner table, essentially. And uh, and there, there's that authority. So we're all growing up differently. And we bring what we, we bring all that into our adult lives. And it's uh, how do, how does it affect us? Like when we uh, leave home for the first time, go to college and, oh, are we going to get trapped in cults or uh, groups? That, I mean, that, that's, that's such a critical time, like leaving the family. And uh, an interesting thing, uh, there's a Hasidic guy, who, someone who grew up Hasidic, who is teaching physics online on YouTube in Yiddish to reach people who are still in that Hasidic mm -hmm. community. And it's fascinating how he's come to a new understanding, how he can accept the laws of physics with his teaching, reconcile that somehow. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a lot about upbringing, but also nurture. Thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. I love the Yiddish physics teaching. Yeah, I'll find it. Um, Carl, please. Yeah. I'll post, I'm posting some links to it, but um, well, I'd heard um, Peter Gable talk at a Network for Spiritual Progressives conference here in D.C. back in 2006 and um, inspired me to put together a playlist, which I had actually uh, burned onto custom CDs, that, um, digital vinyl, um, Verbatim had these digital vinyls that I made it look like little 45s. I don't know if you ever saw those, but I actually handed one to to um, Rabbi Lerner near the end, and I made a YouTube playlist out of it. So I'll post that as well. And um, Peter Gable's last book was, um, I think it was his last book. He unfortunately passed um, about, a, I guess, about a year and a half ago. Now, but it's the desire for mutual recognition and stuff. So I'm putting a couple links into those. You mentioned it last week also. I, I had connected it to my brain. Already had it. It's relevant for almost every conversation I've been in since October 7th, it seems like. so. Yeah, it's funny. When I, I think I don't. OGM call long ago, I, I talked about part of my personal philosophy, which is I went hunting around for what are good instructions for life. And I wound up with Thich Nhat Hanh's deep listening and loving speech. That if we start with deep listening and loving speech, lots of good things cascade out of that, because then other people get heard. Deep listening means acknowledgement of the other. It means a whole bunch of things like that. And loving speech means start with kindness, assume good intent. It means a whole bunch of things like that as well. So I would I would crank those into the instructions for mankind and ignore the uh, the Ten Commandments, for example, which are very strange. But that's another conversation. Uh, Stuart. Yeah, 
Um, and some of the great wisdom around is um, simple, and and we forget it. Um, as I as I'm thinking about and audiencing, um, as well as participating in this call, I think about the you know the brilliance of um, of Viktor Frankl and, and man's search for meaning. You know that between the taking in of information and how we respond to it um, in that instance is how we express and where we express our own humanity. And if we could learn to make choices around um, more human responses, we would all be um, a lot better off. Um, and I also wanted to, um, to, to, uh, to recognize Peter Gable. Um, Peter wrote an endorsement for one of my books, The Book of Agreement. Um, aside from his work with Tukun, Peter was also the um, president or leader of, of, of um, the new law school, which is a very progressive law school in San Francisco. But Peter wrote an endorsement for the Book of Agreement that literally made me cry. <laughs> um, not figuratively, but literally, because I felt so seen and understood by what it was that he wrote. It, it makes me choke up a little bit now, even, even thinking about that. Can I just insert a comment? One of the most helpful suggestions that I learned from my husband was, can you tell me a little more? Curiosity is one of the really useful paths in. Uh, it's a, I think it's a part of deep listening. It's like, can you can you say more about that? Uh, can you help? Can you help me see your point of view? Can you help me understand it better? Any of those kinds of questions are really generative, useful questions. Patty, welcome back. Thanks. And um, just the name after um, while, while Stuart was sharing, what occurred to me was Stuart when you were sharing about the the power of this. Um, you said Peter Gable was his name. Yes. Writing this really moving forward for for your book and how you felt so um, you you felt so seen and understood. It just struck me that I mean, in my own experience, it seems like that's something I crave, and it seems like many other humans I meet are also uh, craving that in equal measure. And it seems to me maybe one of the barriers of um, navigating and moving forward in this time where the the perceived cost of actually seeing and understanding someone can be so high, especially when their worldview, their perception of how the world works might be so different and perhaps challenging to another's. Um, that to me seems like a big obstacle, right? So we have this, this to me, what feels like a deeply innate human need and a system that has been orchestrated, I would say very effectively to make meeting that need um, seem to be so costly for so many. Totally, totally agree. Go ahead, sir. Let me actually read before Stacy goes. Let me read the endorsement because it please. Has, Thank has, you. I think what Peter said was Levine begins from the premise that the purpose of agreement is to build a bridge to the other and to realize your common aspiration for connection. Writ large, this idea would revolutionize the study and practice of law and help to realize that our spiritual nature as social beings in pursuit of mutual uh, affirmation. Love that, thank you. Uh, Stacy, were you going to jump in? I was, I, so thank you for reading that and that's wonderful. I don't want it to seem like my comment is directly related to that because it's the other side of it. We'll, we'll sort that out. No okay, because <laughs> what I wanted to to also share is that keep in mind that what that does is it skews us to what we want to be seen for. And that ties into this whole fiat lens and what success is and what's valuable. So there's I just wanted to throw in some other factors that play in because we're systems thinkers here. So I just wanted to bring in some other pieces. Can you say a tiny bit more about what you want to be seen for? Uh, 
Is this about identity, about um, how others judge us, see us? What which piece of that are you tugging on? So I think I think we all want to be seen for the value that we bring to the world. I think that's pretty clear. We don't necessarily want to be seen for the places that we're vulnerable. You know, that's something that we want to hide. That's the part that's covered with shame or what whatever it is. Although sometimes there's so much value in being able to reveal that and so much healing can happen as a result of revealing that because other people have those same things and they can learn that by recognizing that these are common things that we have. Um, that's one piece of what I would say, but there's a lot of things, but it, you know, let me stick with one. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Um, anyone else with some closing thoughts? We've got only a couple minutes left. I have a poem for us if we want to go out with it. Stuart, you mentioned you had a, 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 pur a proposed poem as well. If you wanted to read that one in, I will follow you. But uh, any other thoughts as we get toward the end of this call before we go to poetry? Good. And, and it feels, unless somebody wants to go back to some of the specific topics like identity politics and trauma and all that kind of stuff, I think we might have talked our way through this one for now. I don't feel compelled to go back to it next week or the week after right now, which doesn't mean I don't think this is incredibly urgent and is something we need to like do more of, focus on more. But uh, I'm aware of, of the, the time and space that we have here and how we how we divvy it up some. Um, so with that, I will ask Stuart to read his poem. Great. So it's called Resilience, and I think resilience is the way we um, keep stepping beyond um, whatever impact trauma um, has had on our, our lives. Resilience. Demons of consciousness <clears throat> defy intention, renders you spineless in a dimension. Cancel self-confident energy of being, blindfolds vision, relegates seeing. Surly monster seems without end, enveloping, demanding you bend. Progress halted, actions stop, life is molasses, you want to drop. Will it end this bottomless pit? Will you surface intact with wit? In this chasm, been here before, daunting passage, not what you came for. Helping endure, seeing the end, resilience elevates. It is a friend. Ordeal ends, finally turn. Lessons prevail, so much to learn. Life not for the meager or weak, nor the faint hearted acting like sheep. Listen to voices, follow your heart, let life come unfolding as art. Cultivate wisdom, be kind to friends, hear with compassion, serve, make amends. Be patient, humble, no worry about trends. Take joy in hours, connected to friends. Thanks, Stuart. Um, and here's a link to the poem I'd like to read in, which is by P. Ryan, one of my favorite poets, and it's titled uh, Least Action. Is it vision or the lack that brings me back to the principle of least action, by which in one branch of rabbinical thought, the world might become the kingdom of peace, not through the tumult and destruction necessary for a new start, but by adjusting little parts a little bit, maybe turn that cup a quarter inch or scoot up that bench. It imagines an incremental resurrection, a radiant body puzzled out through tinkering with the fit of what's available. As though what is, is right already, but askew. It is tempting for any person who would like to love what she can do. Love that. Should I read it again? Thanks. Thank you. Um, I love it too. It's, it's beautiful. Really hit. Least Action by Kay Ryan. 
Is it vision or the lack that brings me back to the principle of least action, by which in one branch of rabbinical thought, the world might become the kingdom of peace, not through the tumult and destruction necessary for a new start, but by adjusting little parts a little bit. Maybe turn that cup a quarter inch or scoot up that bench. It imagines an incremental resurrection, a radiant body puzzled out through tinkering with the fit of what's available, as though what is, is right already, but askew. It is tempting for any person who would like to love what she can do. That's okay. I really think that's that that is so okay. It's fabulous, yeah. Thank you all. Um, thank you for a wonderful call. Really appreciate our time together. Thanks for showing up with your hearts and your stories and all this good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.